Who had a good time today? So did I, really. <laughs> it was a great day today. Um, many of you have actually come up to me today and really remarked that uh, of the quality of our program today, and uh, I appreciate that. All of us at the Heartland Institute appreciate that. Um, you know, putting this thing together is you know always a challenge, but it's fun, it's rewarding, and it's um, extra rewarding when the people we invite to speak say yes. And so a lot of the great people you heard today um, you know, said yes to that. So I actually, let's all give a round of applause to all of our speakers so far in this conference today. <laughs> Another attendee also uh, noted to me that, uh, well, it was good news. He said he doesn't recall seeing as many people in their 30s and younger at one of our climate conferences. And uh, I have to agree. And so um, I would actually like to recognize and let's have some applause for these young people who are here to learn the truth about climate and how important it is for them to know that and to spread that message. And uh, that note about the younger people in attendance um, you know, brought to mind the fact that there are a lot of old friends, great scientists, fantastic speakers, uh, that are no longer at one of our climate conferences. Um, it has been rather sad, actually, that over the last year, I get emails from people saying that your friend, who's been a big part of the Heartland Institute or the Heartland Conferences over the years, has just passed. And so, this is not a video that we wanted to produce but we thought it fitting to pay tribute to some of the people that have been a big part of the Heartland Institute, a big part of this conference, and a big part of the lives of many people in this room. So this is a tribute to them. I had written this uh, plan and uh, Heartland published it into a booklet and shortly thereafter, I was on a program here in Washington with Senator Inhofe. I'm probably the only living scientist uh, in the country today who uh, has to claim responsibility that there is a U.S. EPA because between uh, 1968 and 1971, I was on a Blue Ribbon Committee studying the idea of creating an environmental protection agency, you know, which uh, President Nixon signed in 71. And I'm kind of now uh, doing penance for that crime. And uh, so I wrote this plan uh, to get rid of it. And he paused for a second and he said, Dr. Lair, if uh, you think uh, going around uh, presenting this plan to get rid of EPA makes up for the crime you committed in creating EPA, you're, uh, you're, you're wrong. And uh, uh, everybody fell out of their chairs uh, laughing. Thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, economists are not used to that. I'm wearing a Chicago climate change cap that an, uh, was issued at the launching of the sulfur dioxide futures contracts. And uh, I have, I'm starting a collection of caps from failed institutions. I, I also have one for MF Global, you know. <laughs> Who knows, these could be very, very, uh, uh, pricey uh, in the near future. Well, uh, as you notice that it's the time for adjourning this meeting is just a minute away. And uh, <laughs> it's my luck that there was no emissions trading here to allow me to buy more time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that those are the breaks, uh, which leads me to observe that emissions trading has not been too successful, but it has made one trader successful. Thank you for your attention. And by the way, Obama may believe, all right, that they, there's more hurricanes. We believed that we could get to the moon, but we also had data. We had hard data. We had measured data, calibrated data, that told us that we knew we were going to get there, and we did it. That's how we got to the moon. There's one other thing we did. 
And I'm going to take some time here and talk about Hal. Every astronaut who ever went up owes his life to Hal. Why? Because he and his team figured out the resonance problems between the fuel delivery system and the rockets that was making them blow up. And Walt, probably the bravest astronaut we had in the darkest days of Apollo, it was Walt who went up in the newly redesigned Apollo 7 and with the hopes and prayers of a nation, rocketed into the heavens and into the history books. This is the right stuff. And if you want to see integrity, intelligence, and courage all wrapped up into one, go to these guys later on, look them in the eye, shake their hands, and give them a good salute, because they deserve it. On October 11, 1968, Colonel Cunningham made his mark on history by piloting the Apollo 7 spaceflight mission for 11 days. In 2010, he had had enough of bad science and publicly rejected the so-called scientific consensus surrounding man-made global warming, publishing a paper called Global Warming, Facts versus Faith. So what's happening is they're picking and choosing the data. They're not looking at the big picture. And it's, it's very disturbing to somebody that's a, a legitimate scientist, a physicist. For more than 40 years, people have been asking me about how fragile our planet appears from space. And I always have to tell them, really, what I was most impressed about was the beauty of our planet and the fact that we have survived changes in uh, climate for four and a half billion years. I tend to analyze data. Uh, I have not found one single bit of data that would support the cause, you know, that says that we're warming uh, the temperature of the uh, Earth. And those of you sitting out here in this room, you're identified as climate denialists, uh, or fake experts, if you will. And those of us who signed the letter to the NASA administrator, we're described as having, quote, not an ounce of climate expertise. And that is one of the nicest comments, if, if, you, if you bother <laughs> to read it. We're in a war. It's a war to avoid the lowering of our standard of living and the economic destruction of the world as we know it. And that's what President Klaus, I think, was referring to last night as well. And it's, uh, it's hard to be optimistic about winning that war. And what I'm talking about this, this uh, morning is really to ask you to help join in that, not the war that you've al already won. And finally, we're down it all in the art and science of model, climate model tuning talks about the increasing diversity in the applications of climate models. There are a variety of goals for specific problems and different models for being optimized to perform better. On a particular metric, I love this, related to specific goals, expertise, hmm, expertise, or cultural identity of a given modeling group. My God, identity politics enters climate modeling. Thus do social science and physical sciences go hand in hand. You decide what the code is, and you decide what the answer is, and you just use the model as a doll, a plaything, to make it look real. But you decide what it is. Translation, it's a scientist, not the science, that determines what's anticipated and acceptable. Now, do you seriously believe that if you have your hand on the control knob, and if you decided that the anticipated acceptable range was one and a half degrees C of warming over the course of the next century, as the Russian model, INM CM4, says, do you think you're going to get renewed? Buddy, you're going back to coach. And that is the prime target of avoidance for all climate scientists. In escapable conclusion, EPA's endangerment finding is fatally flawed and should be vacated. And we want to take this forward, Marlo, Myron, everyone here. We need to take this forward. Nobody is going to respond unless there's pressure. It's easy to say, oh, it's too much of a lift. Well, I've been lifting this for a long time. We got help here. Let's do it, and let's do it now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm still trying to recover from being mentioned in Mark Stein's speech. That's, um, 
There, there are certain achievements in life, and I think that that's one of them. And, and of course, I'm always reminded of, of the question about why did the Canadian cross the road? <laughs> and the answer was to get to the middle. <laughs> And, and what, what, what's particularly funny about that is that it fills both stereotypes because to an American, that's an insult. And a Canadian says, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it is no coincidence that the 97% consensus was created. Anything less than that would put doubt in the public's mind. Imagine if it was only an 80% consensus then the public could say, well, 20%, that's a pretty large number. But 3%, no, we can easily marginalize those. Margaret Mead, and this is a great challenge, Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The public can't believe that a small group of people have been able to fool the world. And yet that is what exactly has happened. And so to get past that and to help the public understand what is going on is the challenge for the future. Mahatma Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they attack you, then you win. It, Guess what? We're in the attack phase. We're on the verge of winning, and I've sent that, sensed this more than any previous Heartland conference I've been at. Thank you. heavy-hearted because I miss my friends. But at the same time, they would want us to be here. They'd want us to celebrate. They'd want us to have light hearts. They'd want us to carry on in loving memory, but also in celebration. And that's what we're going to keep doing. We're going to keep fighting for people like Jay and Tom and Pat and Walt and Jim and Tim. Jay Lair was with Heartland when I first joined Heartland. Two thousand one, and he was he was Mr. Heartland. His blood was Heartland green. He was a happy warrior. If there's one word I can think of for Jay, it was energy. He was the energizer bunny. He was out on the road. I don't know how many days a year. It's in the triple digits every year. And yet he'd always be sending me a note. Hey, what can, I, what, what can I work on? Is there a book review I can write? Is there something I can write for environment and climate news? And uh, nothing could stop Jay. One of the stories I heard from Jay, <laughs> he had uh, at one point, and, and this is funny, at her service, this came up as well, his service recently in Ohio. Um, somebody asked him once about, well, you have all this energy. Uh, do you take a nap? Is that where you get it from? Do you take naps? And Jay says, I took a nap once. It was October 18th, 1976. And I slept for about an hour or two, and I woke up just feeling so sluggish and devoid of energy, I have never done it since. And those hours that he was awake... They weren't put to waste. It wasn't like he wasn't napping, but he was just sitting around lounging. Jay had such a spirit to learn, to know, to share, to do, to experience. Uh, for those of you who have known Jay, you know he was a tremendous athlete. He would uh, participate in triathlons well into his 70s. It might have even been into his 80s. Uh, he played hockey as a goaltender, again, well into his 70s. He played baseball. He did all sorts of things. Um, Jay Lair, uh, you will be missed. You'll be treasured. You gave so much to us. Jim Johnston, the second person uh, featured in that video, Jim Johnston was a founding director on the board of directors of the Heartland Institute. Jim was an economist whose uh, knowledge 
on all matters economics. Uh, I find it difficult to believe it's surpassed, has been surpassed anywhere. What made Jim so special to me and to everybody at Heartland is that Jim would come into the office on a weekly basis. He'd drive in. He'd take care of, he was a Heartland treasurer. He'd take care of signing checks, reviewing finances. And then he'd sit in on our Heartland staff meetings. He would take Heartland staffers under his wing. He was just so kind-hearted and engaged with everything Heartland. I never heard Jim say a bad word or a frustrated or discouraged word about anybody in Heartland. Uh, it was just, um, it was an absolute blessing to know Jim. And you're very much going to be missed. Tom Weissmuller. Tom was a fantastic scientist. You saw him with the right climate stuff uh, team. And uh, he was brilliant. He was brilliant in all matter science. He wasn't a single issue scientist. Uh, he loved not only, of course, with his work with the right climate stuff, but he loved engaging uh, scientifically in matters such as sea level rise and, and all things marine related. Um, he also had a spirit that was always um, he was positive, always optimistic, and he would be very angry with me if I don't, didn't mention here the truth that Tom Weissmuller was an incredible poker player. <laughs> it's a passion of mine, it's a passion of Tom's, and uh, when we would get together, uh, he would love to share uh, stories of his exploits at the poker tables. And in case, because poker, poker players are notorious liars, not only at the table, but afterwards. So Tom would show me the trophy or the chip that he got for winning the tournaments. He was amazing. Um, and it just uh, testifies to the sharpness, sharpness of his mind and his analytical skills. Walt Cunningham, if there's a word that comes to mind for Walt, for Jay, it's energy. Um, for Walt Cunningham, it's graciousness. Walt Cunningham was a true American hero. I mean, a class one, top tier American hero. Uh, some people may not be old enough to remember. I don't remember when this happened, but I certainly knew of it uh, through my learning in school. Walt Cunningham was the pilot of Apollo 7. Apollo 7 was the first manned Apollo mission. This First of all, it was an incredible honor to be recognized for your skills to be able to pilot the mission, but also taking on such incredible risk for your country and for the advancement of science. Walt was one of those people that would be held up here, justly so, among American heroes in the 60s in the space race. And yet, when I first met Walt, as has been the case many times when I've met some of the great people in this room, I was nervous. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just James Taylor. This is Walt Cunningham. Um, I, didn't, I felt nervous going up and saying hi. He obviously gets this from many people, but, boy, James, oh my goodness, so nice to meet you. But it wasn't just me. Everybody I ever saw Walt interact with, he just had that kindness of spirit, and he just loved to, to meet people, to get to know people. Nothing went to his head ever, and he was a tremendous scientist on top of that. Pat Michaels. Boy, where to begin with Pat? Great friend. Pat Michaels is one of the primary reasons that I'm with the Heartland Institute, uh, that the issue of climate science is so near and dear to my heart. When I was at Syracuse University College of Law, I was the editor-in-chief of the Federalist Voice newspaper. And as a young, freedom-minded person, libertarian, conservative, kind of a mix of the two. I was exposed to on CNN and USA Today and all that, all the stories about this climate crisis and about how the world was going to bake and where to blame. And I thought, I wanted to write an article because let's face it, I mean, I have my principles, but if, if we're destroying the planet, you have to do what you have to do no matter what it is to stop this from happening. And I had taken a number of atmospheric science courses as an undergrad. I knew where to go for the data. I knew where to go for the underlying information. And I supplemented that. As I started looking into it, I said, you know, this doesn't seem to add up to me. It, it seems like we're maybe causing some warming, but all these scenarios, boy, I just don't see it. And I was pointed to Pat Michaels' book, 
Sound and Fury, The Politics of Global Warming. I think that was the exact title. And it was just eye-opening. It pulled everything together that I had suspected when reading his book. And, and the same way with Pat, when I first met Pat at an ALEC conference, American Legislative Exchange Council, again, I was timid. I was afraid to go up and see him. But I had to tell him. Oh, and by the way, one, one side note on that. That was the first issue of the Federalist Voice that we published. And in addition to challenging the climate science narrative, we took on the staff and the woke positions. At, at the time, we didn't call it woke, but you know what I mean. And we got called up to the dean's office. I was personally threatened with being kicked out of Syracuse College of Law for this, this insolent behavior. So I wanted to tell Pat, hey, you're the reason I almost got kicked out of law school. And Pat just laughed and loved it. And uh, over the years, um, it's just been uh, incredible to call Pat a friend. And, it doesn't, see the same, doesn't seem the same to be here at an international conference of climate change or anywhere else and not seeing Pat, as he knows his time on stage is about to come, begin pacing like a caged tiger. All right, my time, it's almost time, back and forth, working himself up. And that was Pat. He was intense, he was vibrant, he was incredibly knowledgeable, and he was a very true, loyal, great friend, not just to me, but to many others. And finally, Tim Ball. Tim gave everything he had to truth and to what we stand for today, for climate realism, climate truth. Tim, many of you don't know this, when he would come speak at our conferences uh, the last two or three times, he was in such pain physically and it would be very difficult for him to make the trip. And yet, he soldiered up and came to speak, to, to meet with us, to speak with us, to renew friendships. It took a lot out of him physically. Um, and his voice is an important one that needed to be heard and still rings true today. We also took a lot out of Tim emotionally. There's only so much you can go through being attacked uh, with vitriol over and over again. And uh, I know Tim in his last few years, if you know him, he was worn down. But at the same time, at the same time, he, he never surrendered his commitment to truth and the ability to speak the truth, whether, whether we're right or wrong in our interpretation of the truth. I'm 1,000% convinced we're right, especially on this issue. But regardless, it's so important for us to be able to, to speak what we believe is the truth. And Tim never gave up on that. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for all that you gave. We love you for that. Um, with that, I'm sorry to get choked up. I just love these people. But they would want us to celebrate them. They'd want us to have a wonderful time. They'd want us to have light hearts. And they added so much to our lives. And they still do. Uh, they still do. A person who adds quite a bit to my heart, one time out of five when we're not busting on each other, but a great friend of mine, co-sponsor, he's the president of our, our co-sponsor, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. Uh, Craig Rucker is going to be coming up on stage to hand out the first of our awards at this climate conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Rucker. First off, let me just start before we uh, get into my award, just uh, complimenting the Heartland Institute. What a great video. And James, that was very powerful, articulate, accurate, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, we at CFACT also, I mean, I I've personally, I know Mark Morano, uh, the rest, uh, number on our staff have gotten to know these folks too. Uh, we got to know them quite uh, intimately, not just at this conference. We, uh, in creating our films, Climate Hustle and Climate Hustle 2, interviewed a lot of them, spent time uh, on UN conferences. We jet around the world and take them to some of those things. So got to know them personally. And there's others even before them that uh, deserve some mention. I know we, these are the most recent, but people like Fred Singer, you know, comes to mind. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Bob Carter, 
uh, as well. So there's just so many that, uh, William Gray, uh, that have really blessed us with their pl presence. So, uh, you know, take advantage of the folks you know now. You know, we don't know what the future holds, but, uh, you know, these are, these are real special people, and we're just really blessed to have ever known them. All right, turning attention to our award. This is our award. It is called the Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth. All right, little history of this award. Um, I think it was Joe Bast, yeah, it was Joe Bast, I'm gonna say 2016, 15, came up to me and said, hey, Craig, you know, you at CFAC, you know, you've been participating in these conferences, you really need to come up with an award. That's probably a mistake on his part. But he uh, said, Joe, we'll do it, we'll give a little cash prize, we'll call it that. And he gave me some suggested names, you know, he had the Frederick Seitz Award, and very honest and distinguished. I said, let, let me think about it. So our former president, David Rothbard, and I put our, our heads together and uh, came up with this name. And I said, okay, Joe, it's going to be called the Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth. He goes, <laughs> that's good. Okay. What's it really going to be called? <laughs> and I said, Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth. It was almost like that episode of Animal House. I think it was Kevin Bacon who put it over Bluto and said, hey, you messed up. You trusted me. You know, <laughs> this is what we came up with. Uh, to this award really uh, com uh, commemorates uh, those who are in the climate science movement who don't necessarily have to be scientists, but they're people that go that extra measure to be able to achieve something or get the message out to the public um, in a dynamic way. And there's very various ways that can be done. Um, actually, just naming the first uh, recipient probably gets that point across. That was uh, Lord Christopher Monkton, who... Uh, you know, whether it's uh, jumping out of airplanes or getting kicked out of UN conferences, that's the type of thing that's a dauntless purveyor of climate truth, you know? Could be Walt Cunningham, who uh, not just went in the Apollo mission, which is all nice and good, but he jumped off the cliffs in the Andes with us on a parachute thing too, doing the climate, uh, drawing attention to Climate Gate 2. Could be Mark Morano, who won it last year, uh, who, He's done countless things, but, uh, you know, he got kicked out of the UN Conference too, shredding the Paris Accord, right, and putting up a big sign of Trump and being escorted into the desert of Morocco. <clears throat> so you're getting the picture. This is what we're looking for. Uh, just somebody who gets it out there. And, and really, so many of you could have got that maybe in different ways uh, to do that. But this year's recipient, um, we always like to keep it a mystery. Uh, and we're going to continue to do so until I show you this little video of who this year's recipient is who is well worthy of getting this uh, particular award. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, show the film and you will see who is the 2023 Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth. Presenting CFAC's Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth Award winners throughout the years. 2014. Lord Christopher Monkton. 2017, Colonel Walter Cunningham. 2018, Dr. Fred Singer. 2019, Dr. J. Lair. 2021, Mark Morano. And now, presenting CFAC's Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth Award winner for 2023, Joanne Nova. Hailing from Australia, Joe Nova has made waves globally fighting for climate truth as an author, blogger, journalist, scientist, TV personality, speaker, and activist. Her award-winning blog, joannenova.com.au, is read by almost one and a half million people every year and regularly features groundbreaking research, breaking news, and policy analysis on the climate change issue. But Joe Nova's career wasn't always dedicated to exposing climate extremism. With an education in microbiology and science communication, in her early years, Joe was part of a traveling science circus, bringing hands-on science experiments to kids, including those in remote Aboriginal communities. She also hosted the children's TV series, Why, with Channel 9, 
to make science interesting and entertaining to young people. Okay, try that again. It was during these early years that Joe Nova's thoughts on climate change developed, and she found herself as a staunch member of the political left. For 17 years, I was convinced that we needed to worry about carbon dioxide. I talked on ABC radio. I expressed my concern that we were going to get unstuck, that the climate was going to change in ways we were going to find very difficult to deal with. Absolutely. I talked about that. I convinced people as well. I helped raise funds for the Greens. I was very concerned. But then David came to me one day in early 2007, mm. and of course he'd been working with the Greenhouse Office. Sorry, who's David? He'd been David, my husband, David Evans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr David Evans came up to me and he said, he said, you know, there's no evidence for man-made global warming. And he said that to me and I said, you must be kidding. Of course there's evidence. Of course. What about the ice cores? That was the first thing I could think of. Mm. And uh, he said, well, we know the ice cores and have known since 2003 that there's an 800 year lag mm. between carbon dioxide and temperature. Mm. And I was floored because I read New Scientist every week. I thought I knew at least the big basics of this debate. Mm. And that really stumped me. So I set about looking for evidence to support my belief that CO2 did matter. Mm. And pretty quickly I could see that most of this debate was not about actual evidence, but just about opinions. And when I looked for it, I couldn't find any evidence. Joe Nova's newfound thinking on the climate change issue came to a head in 2007 at the 13th United Nations Conference of the Party's climate change meeting in Bali, Indonesia. There, Nova partnered with CFACT to work with other climate realist activists like Brian Leland, Vincent Gray, Craig Rucker, Lord Christopher Monckton, and her husband, David Evans. Her most noteworthy event involved having a number of scientists and IPCC expert reviewers don lab coats and hold a banner to oppose any new climate treaty. They planted themselves right in front of the main UN Conference Center where Al Gore was scheduled to arrive after receiving his Nobel Prize in Oslo. It garnered tons of media, but UN security forced the activists to leave before Gore's limo arrived. Nevertheless, that stunt set the stage for Joe Nova's tenacious reporting and research going forward. From there, she published The Skeptic's Handbook, which has been translated into 15 languages, and some 220,000 copies have been published and distributed to members of Australian Parliament and the US Congress. Next, Joe Nova published her famous blog, where her research and analysis regularly expose and hammer the Greens, like her findings that supporters of alarmism get paid 3,500 times more than skeptics, which CFACT featured in its film, Climate Hustle 2. Joe Nova has proven herself to be an unstoppable force for the facts in the climate change debate. And she is CFAC's 2023 dauntless purveyor of climate truth. Well, as you can see, we have Joanne on from, I believe, Perth, Australia, if I'm not mistaken. That's your hometown. I've had occasion to visit her there and her wonderful husband, David Evans. Uh, before, Joe, you give a few comments, I just want to share one uh, particular episode that uh, we both experienced together when we were in that uh, 2007 conference in Bali, Indonesia. And this, this always spoke to me and, and said in my mind, you're a dauntless purveyor of climate truth. Uh, when you go to these conferences, you're not always welcomed very well by the UN. I had taken a long flight uh, from the United States to Indonesia, which is quite long, and uh, when I arrived, the first thing I found out, I was about to be kicked out of my own conference. See, a lot of these people went under the CFAC banner, and uh, Christopher Monkton had beaten me there, and uh, basically had published something in an Indonesian paper and was doing these illegal press conferences, or getting rooms, and Barbara Black, of course, calls me in and said, Mr. Hucker, you know what he's doing? He's doing these conferences and everything. I said, I had no idea who he was, but I knew I'd like him. And uh, <laughs> so he was our first Dauntless. But we round and wound up into a problem because we had all these scientists here. We wanted to speak scientific truth, and we didn't have a forum to do our press meetings. And it was Joe Nova who came up with the solution. See, what the UN did is they had this policy which said you could get a room, but the only people that could meet in that room were people of your own organization, meaning CFAC could get a room 
at this conference, but they all had to be members of CFAC, nobody from the outside. They were trying to suppress press conferences, especially because we were monopolizing them. It was Joe Nova who had that creative thinking of how to get around this. So what Joe did, she said, why don't we offer free CFAC memberships to the press for one hour? <laughs> Laugh if you will, we did that. <laughs> we handed out free press memberships and um, opened the doors and let people in. And uh, UN started getting suspicious when a lot of our members were carrying cameras and had camera crews with them, walking into a room, but we'd shut the door and uh, they would carry on interviews with, you know, our people. Um, eventually, UN uh, people came to us and said, I, we think you're having a press conference in there. Let us in. We said, do you have a membership card? <laughs> they weren't allowed in. Now, they were persistent. We didn't let them in. But we got word they were going to go get that evil woman, Barbara Black, who was going to come down there with security and get the thing. But uh, we quickly... Uh, went in and said, hey guys, we gotta kind of wrap it up. We held them off as best we can. And she came down, demanded those doors be opened. We flung them open and out poured everybody with cameras and everything, leaving and said, the meeting's officially closed. <laughs> and she was like really angry, but did nothing because we were fine. And so that was just one of several incidents that occurred down in that conference, which Joanne did and uh, was behind and came up with the clever idea and it always spoke to me. So, Joanne, it's a delight to have you here and uh, congratulations on winning this award. You can go Craig, ahead. Thank you so much. Okay. Craig, I just wanna say I'm, I'm humbled, uh, really, to be in the same category as names like Jay Lear and Walt Cunningham, Mark Morano and Fred Singer, Christopher Moncton, I mean, the giants in the climate world. Um, I so wish I could be with you today. I uh, were defeated by regulations. Um, and I so wish all of them, of course, who've won past awards were still with us today too. I, I want to thank a couple of people behind the scenes uh, who make the blog possible. Uh, people whose names are Mark and Robert and Thomas and Lance and Bryant, and you know who you are and thank you. And there are so many more who chip in I uh, buy me a coffee um, and I can't do it without you. Thank you. And to my commenters, I think we're up to 880,000 comments now. Um, I learned so much from wisdom and expertise there. And I, I want to say to, to the people in the audience today that uh, you may not realise how influential CFAC and Heartland were in my career from the other side of the planet here in Western Australia. The first day in the climate battle, my first day, was at Bali at the UNFCCC climate junket of 2007. And I got to watch the true professionals, Craig Rucker and Mark Morano, and uh, Dauntless, they certainly are. And uh, when I went there, I was a nobody who had never said a word in the climate debate when I came here. And I could see that I could help skeptics. So in the UN, uh, conference was a boot camp and it was so much fun. And there were 12 of us skeptics amongst 12,000 controversial banner and they were going to confiscate this six metre banner that said Kyoto 2 is not needed. You know, we're talking about pretty radical messages. And they banned it and we had to smuggle it in past armed guards, which we did by tricking and giving them uh, videos of the great global warming swindle as we went in. They were just so pleased anyone would give them anything for free that they let us in with our lab coats and our banner that they had just confiscated half an hour before. I, I mean, it was, it was so much fun and it, it was a great way to learn how to do this debate and to watch those, the, the great professionals. Um, and so to all the people who support Heartland and CFAC, you know that I've seen them behind the scenes at events like this. They are unstoppable, totally professional and infectiously cheerful. We just had a riot then. <laughs> I would go again any day to one of those conferences. And here we are, Craig, 14 years later. Who would have thought? Together we're still fighting. I started off in a so as an associate lecturer in science communication as a green. Who would have guessed that today, all these years later, I'm fighting a cult of pagan witchcraft? <laughs> so we, I mean, we pointed up a tropospheric hotspots that 28 million weather balloons can't find and they pretend to stop storms with shields made of solar panels. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. They hold back the tide with their windmills. They think that power stations control the weather. 
and that polar bears can be saved if we just change our light globes. Uh, people are going to laugh at this 100 years from now. They should be laughing now. Uh, so they call us the deniers while they call themselves the science. I mean, their message is so absurd, you can't even satirise it anymore, and it needs billions of dollars to keep it afloat. And I've had people ask me why I do this, and I've said it's kind of like playing mental chess. It's, it's mental chess against the UN, against the institutions, against billions of dollars, and we're doing it, playing this chess with almost nothing, and, and yet we're winning, which is great. And so I just want to finish off by saying to everyone that the evidence, of course, in the science debate, with which was what we want, is so overwhelming, isn't it, that they have to rely on bullying and name-calling. And denier is the core of what they do, so let's use their name-calling against them, spread the word, red pill everyone. Bullying is a brittle art. And every time they call us deniers, it's obvious that it's not a science debate. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in an information war. Shore up your lines of communication. Look out for the people on the front lines. And whenever we get the truth out there, we win. And that's why they're so afraid of our words and our jokes and our cartoons. And thank you, Craig, and thank you, CFACT and Heartland, for running the best science conferences on the planet. Well, and thank you, Joanne. And, um, you know, we're overdue for a reunion. I think the next uh, COP is going to be in the United Arab Emirates coming up in, uh, what, November of next year. And if you guys, you know, want to take another stab at it, you're always welcome to join us and we'll see what mischief we can get into. Thank you. And you certainly um, are a, a wonderful advocate for our cause and uh, best to your husband. Okay, and now I'm up here, and I'm not sure what happens next. Jim. <laughs> you can leave the stage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the president of the Science and Environmental Policy Project, Ken Happala. Greetings, carbon-based life forms. <laughs> All complex life on this planet is carbon-based, including Al Gore, <laughs> I think. In his lectures on gravitation, the brilliant physicist and teacher, Richard Feynman, said, if there's something very slightly wrong in our definition of the theories, then full mathematical rigor may convert these errors into ridiculous conclusions. Unfortunately, many in Washington confuse such mathematical conclusions with science. In 2014, SEP established the Frederick Seitz Award in his honor. In the early 1990s, Seitz wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal stating that the 1995 IPCC report was the worst abuse of the peer review process he had witnessed in over 60 years in American science. Dr. Frederick Seitz entomized the courage, independence of thought, and commitment to integrity in science to which all scientists should aspire. He made major scientific contributions in his field of specialty solid-state physics, but he also devoted much of his life 
serving as an ambassador and advocate for science. The site's award is decided by an awards committee led by Will Happer and for 1922, the committee chose the recipient of this award. It is my present, his resume is in your program, I won't go over it. It is my honor to present this trophy as a symbol of the award to a former director uh, director of a division in theoretical physics and a professor of applied mathematics, Emeritus Christopher Essex. Thank you. Sir. Wow, this is a real honor. Uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in the free state of uh, Florida, um, especially being Canadian. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank uh, the, the various uh, organizers of this event, uh, Heartland and CFACT, and, uh, and of course, uh, SEP. Um, I... Uh, Fred uh, Fred Seitz is um, you know a scientist was a scientist scientist in many respects, and I think that gives me a kind of a motivation to talk about to talk about the nature of science as I've experienced it, um, and uh, what connections it may or may not have with uh, climate. Um, my uh, first thought has to do with uh, how, what. My history is I'm kind of a person who spent my career in the inhumanities. Um, and when I've encountered people from the humanities, uh, they would tell me about uh, science people like Karl Popper and uh, philosophers of that ilk and the nature of falsification, and uh, which is really what one might uh, pursue in talking about science. Uh, I, uh, I, one of the things I learned when they said that uh, they were very thrilled to say they were Popperians, I knew at once that I would never have disciples because no one would want to be known as an Essexian. <laughs> um, so one of the issues that I think comes up as certainly between me and Ken, we have this kind of ongoing discussion about the scientific method. And um, I'm, I like the scientific method, okay, it's fine, but I think there's a lot more to science than the scientific method and trying to persuade uh, climate activists that they should follow that. Uh, I think it's a, a much bigger thing for us human beings um, I personally like the definition given by Feynman, since we don't want to discuss Feynman. Um, Feynman believed, or at least said, that, uh, uh, that science is a belief in the ignorance of experts. Um, and uh, there, that's a really a, a wonderful definition in many respects, but it has a kind of corollary. And that is that in many respects, you're going to be if you're going to go the way of science, you're going to be on your own. You can't really depend upon somebody to tell you what's true and what's not true. You have to think with your own head. And that's a sort of built-in result of that way of thinking. And I, you know, one of the things that I thought I would sort of mention, what it, or to tell you a kind of classical joke about what it's like to actually do science between theory and experiment. That's, there's, a, there's a, this wonderful joke about that, and uh, it goes something like this. So this is what I've actually experienced. Uh, the experimentalist is so excited. He's got this new result, and he goes running up to the theoretician, and he says, I've got this new result. We've got it right here. I've got it written down, and I want to tell you that I've found out that A is greater than B, and the theoretician 
looks a little stunned for a moment, and he says, that's wonderful. A is greater than B? Wonder, it's just great. I can, it fits here, it fits there. Everything is great at this particular time, you know, now that we can move forward with that. At that moment, the experimentalist kind of goes white and he says, oh, I'm sorry, did I say that A is greater than B? I misread it. Yeah, B is greater than A. So the, theoret the theoretician goes blank for a moment and then he says, that's even better. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how often that actually has happened in the real world. Um, I, uh, I want to sort of give you a proper tone for this sort of thing. Um, it was something that left a real impression on me when I was a student in graduate school. Uh, one of the standard uh, topics that you have to study when you're in graduate school, there are several sort of classical topics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, and uh, so on, maybe a bit of general relativity and, and, and uh, classical mechanics and things like that. Uh, but there's also something that's related to Fred Seitz, statistical mechanics. That would be something he would definitely have studied. And so um, I had this textbook uh, on statistical mechanics in the first paragraph in the textbook. There, all, most of it was all mathematics and so on. But the first paragraph left this very strong impression. So I'll read it to you now, just the first paragraph. Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. <laughs> Perhaps it will be wise to approach the subject cautiously. <laughs> now, if you know, Ludwig Boltzmann is a kind of iconic character in, in science. And uh, you, you, you can look up some of these people and if you actually go and be a really weird tourist, you can actually go to Vienna and you can go to the city graveyard and you can go to his grave and you'll see that on his headstone, his epitaph is an equation. It says, S equals K log W. And this is one of the most consequential equations in all of science. And what it does is it relates the world of the microscopic to the macroscopic. And in his world, in his t lifetime, it was not very well accepted. And people had to fight these kinds of well, battles against him and him against them. And, uh, well, he found it very miserable. And uh, you can see the result. This happens more in science than people understand or recognize that there are people always in science who are on what are regarded at that particular time on the fringes. And there's some classical examples like continental drift and Wagner and people like that. But sometimes they're pretty benign and, and you wonder how it was ever an issue. And I recently found out that Georg Ohm, who if you know a little bit about electronics, V equals IR, you know, the IR drop across a, a, a resistor. Uh, apparently, that was something that was controversial at one time. So, I mean, it's, to me, I find that absolutely amazing. But that's actually the nature of the business. You have people on the fringe who actually are going to make an important contribution that will stay with us. So in the case of Boltzmann, you know, there's all this stuff about dynamical systems and ergodic theory and so forth that developed in order in just about the debate over S equals K log W. And then we can go on about that, and I've used that expression many times in my own research uh, for very practical reasons. Now, of course, I've gotten involved in climate, and uh, I've uh, spent a, a fair amount of my uh, early career building climate models, much to my surprise. I, was on, I didn't expect that, but I ended up doing it. And um, I knew that the, right from the very beginning, I'm, 
yes, I am Canadian, but I crossed the road right away. I didn't <laughs> stay in the middle. Um, uh, I knew from the beginning, and that was the 1970s, that there was something seriously wrong with the entire idea of modeling there. People don't appreciate that the way in which models work in the climate business are, is kind of unique. There's probably very few areas in science that have this kind of a structure and nature and the kinds of problems they have to deal with. Uh, issues of extreme computing like nothing else. Um, and there are sort of fundamental issues about what's actually doable. Um, I, you can do a simple calculation and if you do an estimate of how long it would take to do a 10-year forecast that is done with what we would call in the world of applied mathematics a proper computation, where all the wiggles are, are bigger than your grid size. Uh, the, you, and a simple back of the envelope calculation, you can figure out that it would take to do a 10 year forecast one second at a time with a Kolmogorov cutoff of one millimeter. It would take the age of the universe squared to do a 10 year forecast. Um, and so it's, it's a long time. And uh, <laughs> so, so we're forced into a situation. So even when I, if I were, demand it, or they were telling me to do these models, I would have to do the same thing they do. So I don't really want to say, oh, models are bad, and they can't, do, they're all, they are good for what they are. And the problem is we use them for what they are not. And the models, all climate models, every single one of them should be regarded as empirically based. And I say that with a certain amount of trepidation because People had latch on to the, especially in the social sciences, they love the word empirical. For them, that seems to be the equivalent of rigor. And if you have a kind of physics background, empirical models don't really sound that good. Um, and so the, the, the implication is not properly conveyed. So I've had to convey, uh, use a different term to get people to understand. What they are is they're cartoons. They're mathematical cartoons. They're not, they're not the rigorous application of known physics projecting into the future. They are, they are completely cartoonish. And they dis, they're different than meteorological models in, in, a, in, this fall, in a very important way. Because meteorology can follow past patterns and tune and improve to some extent what they have. But the problem is we don't get to play out climate change very often. It's either one climate or the next one, and the time scale is much longer than lifetimes. So, so you don't get the same kind of uh, validation. You get you know, like skill, uh, meteorological skill. You don't get that with climate, although people try to say that they're just the same thing. Well, they're not. You can be empirical about the way things are now, but if you want to do uh, an empirical treatment of a new climate regime, you have to wait until you get to that new climate regime in order to do that. And we don't get to do that. And that's a very important point. We have these, these models are, are not theories in the sense of, uh, Boltzmann and S equals K log W, they're not theories as such. They are cartoon, it's cartoon world, really. And there's nothing wrong with cartoon world if you know that's where you are. But if you're trying to make government policy out of cartoon world, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, it's not going to work. And that's, that's a, a, an important idea to, to get across. And it also has to do with the original idea that I have this present in my remarks was the idea of theory and experiment. That's ultimately what we're getting at. And the thing is that climate models are no theory. They're not a theory for climate. And you can't do experiments with them. All the data we have are observations. And the sort of famous remark of, of, of Feynman when he says, well, you know, you have a theory and you have experiment, you're talking about two things that are fitting mitt and glove together, uh, where you have a controlled experiment, 
you, and you know what to experiment on because you have the theory to give you an idea what to control. So they go together. It's not like one is dominant over the other. They, it's kind of like a bootstrap thing. You get better and better at these, these things. With climate, you have this cartoon, world, this cartoon world presentation, which can be useful in its own way uh, because it just helps you understand certain things you wouldn't be able to envision otherwise. And then you have uncontrolled observations, which are, which are just data. They're not uh, the results of experiments. You can't control them, and as a result, you don't get this relationship. So that makes everything about climate one step less coherent than an actual lab experiment. So you have to think about it that way and back off a little bit and not be so uh, tremendously confident in it. That doesn't mean you can't do interesting and deep uh, science there, but I do think there's too much of a regard for computers as we now have them. Uh, people, uh, was it recently the, you know, one of the latest episodes of computer adoration was with chat GBT. People are concerned with AI and they're very excited about that. And you know, I'd say 25%, yeah, be excited about it. But my first encounter was people coming to me and asking me about a calculation that ChatGBT did and the very first interaction with it. Um, and they showed me what ChatGPT gave them. And it's mathematically wrong. So just so you know that uh, ChatGPT is not uh, the Oracle of Delphi. And, not, and, and uh, climate models are not that either. What really sets us apart as human beings is that uh, we're not just who we are now, uh, just biological beings who were just dumped out in the wilderness someplace, naked and afraid. We have all these accoutrements that we have acquired and knowledge that we've acquired, not just from our parents, but their parents before them and their parents before them, back into time. And this is something very uniquely human of figuring out little things and then incrementally advancing. And it really goes back maybe 10,000 generations. And the thing that makes us really special as human beings is the fact that we may stand here as this kind of imperfect organism, but we have behind us the light of 10,000 generations that backs us uh, so this science that we have is bigger than the governments, it's bigger than the UN, it's bigger than almost anything, and they can put up, they can say they own it, they can say I am science, they can say whatever they want. They don't, they don't. It's our legacy and your legacy, and uh, you should be proud of that legacy and you should try to add to it and uh, appreciate the wonder of the world that it, it reveals to us. Thank you. Congratulations, Christopher. That's a fantastic award. Very worthy recipient. Um, people, as I mentioned earlier, people come up to me all the time with fantastic uh, suggestions for the program of our, uh, of our climate conferences, and I appreciate all of them. And our keynote speaker tonight is somebody who has been recommended to us many, many times, and I always say, I'm trying. We want Alex Epstein here, and uh, this year, we have him, uh, and we have in him, I think, one of the, uh, the most effective public communicators uh, for sensible energy policy and climate policy anywhere in the world. Um, uh, somebody who's here, uh, one of our keynote speakers for lunch tomorrow is uh, Representative Lauren Boebert of Colorado. Uh, she's here, actually, in the back of the room so early uh, especially yeah, for, for a climate conference like this. She's here today, she's here right now because she wants to hear our keynote speaker, Alex Epstein. 
And um, Representative Bober probably knows this, that uh, Alex Epstein is not a scientist. Uh, he's asked that a lot. Um, if you've had the pleasure of watching uh, a climate alarmist Democrat attempt to bully him at a congressional hearing, uh, it doesn't ever work out well for them. Uh, Alex is a philosopher and an energy expert who argues that human flourishing should be the guiding principle of industrial and environmental progress. What a crazy idea that is. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and his newest book, Fossil Future, Why Human Global, While well, Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. Um, Alex has made his moral case, and it's a great one, for fossil fuels at dozens of campuses, including Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and Duke, his alma mater. He's also spoken to employees and leaders at dozens of Fortune 500 energy companies, including ExxonMobil, Chevron, Philips 66, Valero, Enbridge, and TransCanada. Uh, we can hope that he talks some sense into them, but uh, you know those tough nuts are, are pretty tough to crack. Uh, he's been on every cable network that you watch, and a lot of ones that you don't. Uh, Alex and Mark Morano are going to have to have a, a, a contest to see who's been on cable TV more often in the last year. Maybe they'll have to settle it out at the bar after uh, we talk tonight. Uh, you know, Alex Epstein was on Jordan Peterson's YouTube channel uh, two months ago, and that video has been viewed more than 800,000 times already. Two months. Now that's impact, that's influence, and that's reach, and that is something that Alex Epstein uh, does better than any, anybody else, I think, in, uh, on our side of this debate. Uh, Alex, of course, will debate anyone, anytime, anywhere, and has publicly debated the folks at Greenpeace, the Sierra Club, and 350.org over the morality of fossil fuel use. Uh, in fact, to give you a sense of how long he has been at this public debate, I saw tonight on YouTube a 90-minute debate Alex did against Bill McKibben of 350.org. Uh, it didn't seem like Bill McKibben was uh, very happy at the outcome, and, and that was because Alex was only 13 years old. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Alex is, uh, is 32 or 31? 42, 42, 42, yes, I'm sorry, born in 1980. Unlike Christopher, I'm terrible at math. Uh, but, uh, you know, so his, his debate of Bill McKibben that has been around, you know, from 10 years ago, um, if you're watching Bill, if you're watching this video or one of your staff at the 350.org, what, what you have left, um, <laughs> th this is your invitation. Um, if you'd like a rematch with Alex, you've had, you know, many, many years to brush up and not get your clock cleaned. Next time, uh, it's an open invitation. And I promise everybody in this room will be a lot nicer to you than I am right now. So, uh, and, and uh, Alex, one of the things that, that got my attention with Alex and, uh, you know, when we started corresponding, is um, that time that you stood in the middle of the street during a climate march. I hope I'm remembering this right. If, even if I'm making it up, just go with it, okay? <laughs> he stands in the middle of the street with a green shirt that says, I love fossil fuels, and he's engaging people marching down the street to, you know, save the climate and ban fossil fuels. And uh, I think Alex confessed to me, although it didn't show on camera because it was all filmed, that he got a little nervous as he was out there all alone, but you'd never showed it on camera, and uh, obviously that was, that was fantastic. And so, but you do not have to stand in the middle of a, a, a climate march to show that you love fossil fuels. Um, everybody on their chair should have already gotten a pin that says, I love fossil fuels. And if you haven't put it on yet, who loves fossil fuels? <laughs> all right. Well, that is proof then, Alex, that this is likely the friendliest audience you've seen in a while. So let's give a big, friendly welcome to our keynote speaker tonight, Alex Epstein. Um, so I was, I was just thinking uh, in advance of this, of my first Heartland Climate Conference, which was in 2011. And it was a really exciting time for me because many of you here, uh, who are here today, were in this room, are in this room now, or at least 
some of you were there. And uh, there's a lot of legends, including, unfortunately, people that we've lost, including uh, Pat Michaels, who I'll talk about a little bit at the end. And the, the part of the conference that made the biggest impression on me and that made me most permanently admire Heartland in general, but this conference in particular, was a conversation I had with Joe Bast, uh, you know, founder and CEO, longtime CEO of Heartland. And I, I was unknown then. I think the only person who knew me at all uh, and encouraged me at all uh, was actually Rob Bradley, who's here, who was, he, like, he discovered me really early and was incredibly encouraging, which meant a lot. But I don't think anyone knew who I was, really. But uh, Joe was generous enough. I think he took, like, 30 minutes to just talk to this random kid who was asking him questions. And I was sort of ent entertaining the idea of starting my own thing at the time, which I did later that year. And I sort of asked him why he was doing these conferences and what you know, what, what was going on there. And he made this point that just has stuck with me ever since, which is he said that, you know, before the Heartland conferences, there were a lot of people who questioned climate catastrophism and had different views. But he said they were all isolated. There was no community of people. And he said just by bringing together this community, uh, it just made a huge difference. And I knew even then it had made a huge difference and it subsequently made a huge difference. And the other thing he said, at that point or another point was just like, the reason he did this, even though Heartland wouldn't be the most likely group to do it, I mean, they're just sort of a free market group that's known for economics. The reason he did it is just nobody else was doing it and it was the right thing to do. And, and both of those just made such an impression on me. And so it's, it's, it's not really cool to be here just because I was here at a much younger stage, but because I think of this as a place where it's people who want to do the right thing and people who are gathered because they want to make a positive difference. And so I'm very excited today to be able to share what I've learned in the last 10 years and beyond uh, about making a difference on this issue. And the end, I want to say a few words about a couple of individuals, particularly Jay, uh, Lair, and Patrick Michaels, because they both had a really positive uh, uh, influence on me. But so let's start out with uh, I'm gonna, what I want to talk about as my main topic. So. I, have two, I want to share two incredibly controversial ideas, one of which will not be controversial, super controversial to this audience, uh, and then one which I think will. So the, the, the idea that's not controversial to this audience, but that is very controversial in general, I'd say it's the most controversial idea in the world, is the idea that we should be using more fossil fuels going forward. And I say this is the most controversial idea in the world because the least controversial idea in the world is that we should rapidly eliminate fossil fuels. I sometimes ask the question, what is the number one most advocated moral idea in the world? And I think if you look at what governments say, what corporations say, what financial institutions say, it's the idea, you know, some form of net zero. We shouldn't be eliminating our greenhouse gas emissions. That's considered the noblest cause in the world. You notice that companies don't say, hey, we want global human flourishing. They don't advocate for that. They don't advocate, certainly for global empowerment through cheap, reliable energy, but they do advocate for net zero. So it's the, the most popular idea in the world right now is that we should rapidly eliminate fossil fuels and their emissions, and I'm saying we should use more. So that's a controversial idea. I think to many of you it'll be at least plausible. But then the second idea, which I want to emphasize more, is the idea that it really is possible for everyone here to persuade a lot of people. And I think that might be controversial because it's often, often is experienced as very difficult to persuade people. And, and it makes sense, right? Because we're talking about the most controversial issue in the world and people have been indoctrinated in it from K through PhD. So it's just all over the place and it's in the media. And so how do you actually change uh, people's minds? And what happens is I think if, if you don't use a truly effective approach, uh, it doesn't work, and then it's easy to conclude, well, nothing will work. And I, I have something I think of in my mind, I call it the bike lock theory of persuasion. So have you ever seen those cylindrical bike locks that have like four or five cylinders? And the, the thing is, what happens is, let's say you have, it's five cylinders. Like, you open one cylinder, you get nothing. You open two, it still doesn't open, right? You open three, it still doesn't open. You open four, so you're almost totally there, but it still doesn't open. And then you open five and everything opens. And I think this is a lot like persuasion. It's, it's not a forgiving game, but it's a very rewarding game if you know what's going on. Because if you can get all the different cylinders right, then it opens up in an amazing way. And so what I wanna talk about today is what I think I figured out that's allowed me to open the cylinders in a lot of, lot of persuasive situations and to give you all the basic materials that you'll need 
uh, to do this. Now, thanks to Jim for anticipating this. Uh, I always like to say, I always like to practice what I preach, so I hope you all got the I Love Fossil Fuels pins there. Obviously, it takes no courage at all for me to wear this pin uh, at this event, uh, but the I Love, Fossil Fuel logo, I Love Fossil Fuels logo was designed to wear at events where people were very hostile. And so one example is, I don't know, if, I hope we have the video working with audio, but this is me at the largest anti-fossil fuel rally in history, uh, and I flew over on my own dime from Southern California because there were 300,000 people in New York saying fossil fuels were evil, and I wanted to offer a different uh, perspective. Let's see if this plays. Yeah. Do you hear what they're saying? Hey, hey, ho, ho, fossil fuels have got to go. I have a very different opinion on the matter. Uh, let's, go, let's go see if we can engage. Can we just go stand in the middle? So that was a very, uh, very interesting day. I was there for a couple hours. Uh, if you're interested in the footage and that, and more broadly, if you're interested in getting a whole bunch of good resources to share with people, please, please, please do one of two things. So one is you can fill out that card. Most importantly, just fill out your email address. There should be cards at your seat, and that'll put you on our list that I can give you a whole bunch of resources, and we have weekly talking points. Or you can just send an email, if, particularly if you're watching this later, just send an email to resources at alexepstein.com. You don't need to put a subject or anything else. I mean, you can put anything you want, but just send an email there, resources at alexepstein.com, and you will uh, get this and many, many other resources. So I do really, I do really believe this. And I do believe I have a lot uh, to say about how to do this persuasively. And I think the key to me believing this and the key to me being persuasive is actually the thing that uh, people think is the least relevant. And I think Jim also mentioned this. Uh, I was testifying in front of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee in front of my senator at the time, since I live in Southern California, Barbara Boxer. And she tried to explain to me why my subject uh, has, was totally irrelevant and then I tried to explain to her why it was the most important. So let's look at this. Jeff Stein, are you a scientist? No, philosopher. You're a philosopher? Yes. Okay. Well, this is the Environment and Public Works Committee. I think it's interesting we have a philosopher here talking about an issue. It's to teach you how to think more clearly. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> so. So I didn't, I didn't plan that, um, but that, that's what came out. So, so philosophy is considered impractical. My background is, so I wanted to be a tech entrepreneur. Uh, I didn't want to be any kind of intellectual, but I was so in love with philosophy. And when I, when I told my advisor I was in computer science at the time as a, a sophomore at Duke, or I think a junior actually, and I told him like, I'm never programming again because I want to become a philosopher. And he was super unimpressed as you might imagine. And the basic logic is, well, whoever has a problem and says, let's call a philosopher for a solution. So it's thought of as this very impractical thing. I think of it as the most practical thing. I actually think it's, it's very practical for thinking about anything and it's very practical uh, for persuasion. I think the reason is because philosophy studies the basic ideas that guide all of our thinking and all of our action. Uh, all of our action. And in particular what it does is it gives us a framework. I like the metaphor of a framework a lot. So the framework, a framework is the starting structure of something, so you often think of it with a building. The, the building has a framework, and the thing about a framework is it shapes everything else. So the framework of a building shapes everything else about the building, and the same thing is true with a thought or a communication. So the way you think about things, your basic philosophy, your framework, uh, shapes how you think. And so I divide philosophy, one way to do it is in three basic categories, your thinking methods, your assumptions, and your values. I think all of those have huge implications for how you think about something, and how you communicate. And so, and the, the thing that really got me uh, interested in this issue and convinced that I could make a difference is that there is a thinking method that is obvious and that everyone agrees with, and yet almost nobody follows it with fossil fuels. And this is very powerful because if you can get people to recognize this thinking method and say they agree with it, then you can actually get them to think rationally. So this is the thinking method. And it's very, very simple. 
But what's interesting is almost every, everyone agrees with it, nobody has ever disagreed with this, and yet no, almost nobody follows it. So, and it's just the idea if you carefully weigh benefits and side effects. So, when you're evaluating what to do about any product or technology, so it could be prescription drug, it can be AI, whatever, you need to carefully weigh the benefits and side effects of every option. So let's say you're considering a prescription drug, what do you do? You, you ask the doctor, hey, what are the benefits? And what exactly are they? How significant are they? And then what are the negative side effects? And then you look at your alternatives the same way and you make a decision. Does anyone disagree with this? Does anyone think, no, you should only look at benefits and ignore side effects? No, you could die, right? Does anyone think you should only look at side effects? Uh, or you should only look at benefit, you should only look at side effects and ignore benefits. No, you could die. Nobody thinks you should exaggerate benefits. Nobody thinks you should exaggerate negative side effects. And yet, I think it's inarguable that just about every leading thinker violates this principle incredibly. And this is, a, this is actually a hugely powerful thing because it's so powerful if you can find a principle that is common sense but not common practice because then what you can do is you can get people to agree with the principle and once they agree with the principle, they're much, much more likely to follow it in practice. So I wanna break this down, this principle of carefully weighing the benefits and side effects. I think it, it boils down to three irrefutable principles when we're thinking about energy and climate and particularly fossil fuels and climate. So one is we need to factor in fossil fuels benefits. So if you just ask somebody, hey, when we're looking at fossil fuels, yeah, we need to look at negative side effects, but don't we also need to look at benefits? Everyone will say yes. And yet, almost none of our thinkers seriously do, do this. And one thing I noticed very early on, which has really come to pass recently, is that nobody talks about or talked about the amazing food benefits of fossil fuels. When I was debating Bill McKibben, one point I made was, you know, fossil fuels are the food of food. And it's really true because they, they provide the diesel that powers so many of our agricultural machines, like a combine harvester that can reap and thresh a thousand times as much wheat as a human being. So they power those machines. And then they're also the basis of natural gas fertilizer. And without this, eight billion people could not be fed. And yet we almost never talk about it. And by we, I don't just mean, you know, ignorant people in the media, even supposedly our smartest, what I call designated experts, ignore this. So one example I give in, in chapter one of Fossil Future is Michael Mann, whom I'm sure some of you have heard of and don't have, yeah, don't have, on feelings about. So you're probably familiar with him more in terms of uh, his uh, liberties he's taken in, in architecting what's called uh, the hockey stick, or his, his hockey stick, as we'll see, there's a real hockey stick of human flourishing that's more important and definitely more valid. But man, in his book, he has a book called The Madhouse Effect, which is his summary of all the relevant issues with fossil fuels and climate. The interesting thing is he talks about food a lot, but he only talks about potential negatives of fossil fuels. He talks about you know, if it gets warmer, it'll cause this and this problem. And that's a fine thing to investigate. I, I don't think his investigation is accurate, but the most notable thing is he does not once mention diesel powered or oil powered machinery or natural gas fertilizer. Now think about this, how can you not mention this and you're a leading expert? And what it just shows is we live in a culture of fossil fuel benefit denial. People are not thinking about the benefits of fossil fuels. And if you don't think about the benefits of something as significant as fossil fuels, you're gonna make terrible, terrible decisions. So that's principle one. Principle two, this is even less recognized than the benefits in general is the, what, are, what I call the climate mastery benefits of fossil fuels. So we have this narrative that fossil fuels impact on climate can only be negative. And even with many of the people questioning climate catastrophism in the past, what I noticed was they would try to neutralize these claims of, well, fossil fuels have this really adverse uh, consequence, and that's a good thing to do when, when the thing is being exaggerated or, or concocted, but there's also this issue of the positives of fossil fuels. And I don't just mean the positives of warming and greening, although those are definitely, there are definitely positives there too. But what I'm talking about is how we use fossil fuels to make our climate far safer. So one of the major things we do with fossil fuels is we neutralize climate danger. We do things like build sturdy buildings to protect ourselves from storms. That takes a ton of energy. We have irrigation systems that protect us from drought, which is historically the, the world's cl largest climate-related killer. Of course, we have heating and air conditioning systems. We have storm warning systems. We do all these things to neutralize climate danger, and yet we don't talk about that with fossil fuels. We say, oh, well, we'll get rid of fossil fuels and we'll be so safe from climate, but you ignore all these, this ability to neutralize climate danger that's so significant. So it's another case where it's really ignored. And it's not just ignored by, quote, dumb people. It's ignored, for example, by the supposedly amazing intergovernmental panel 
uh, on climate change. And one, one criticism now of the IPCC, finally it gets some criticism, is that, oh, well, the, its findings get distorted by media and by PR people and by the leadership of the UN. And that's certainly true. But I don't think we should let the IPCC off the hook because its methodology is terrible, at least with regard to this issue. Because the IPCC does not mention this issue of fossil fueled climate mastery. In its thousands of pages of reports, it doesn't talk about it, even though, as we'll see, that's led to record lows in climate-related disaster deaths. And so you cannot talk about climate and fossil fuels and ignore the climate mastery benefits if you're a climate-focused organization, unless you're just incredibly irresponsible, and yet that's the norm. But the power here is, once you point this out, people will think about the climate mastery benefits, and I'm proud to have contributed to that spreading quite a bit. Now, the third one, and I think this will be the, maybe the most familiar to this audience, but this is another irrefutable idea. So nobody will question the first two, but no one will practice it, will practice them unless you point them out. The third is you have to factor in negative and positive climate side effects with precision. So this means, yes, you want to look at any adverse consequences of warming that's caused, but you also need to look at positive consequences of warming. Same thing with any other associated uh, climate change. And then the other thing is precision. It's so, so, so important with anything to be pre precise, especially when you're weighing benefits and side effects. And yet it's commonplace to lionize people like Al Gore who totally distort any semi-reasonable scientific interpretation of anything. Al Gore's movie that's probably the most distributed piece of content on this issue ever. I mean, I don't know how many tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of children were influenced by this and he portrays 20 foot sea level rises as imminent. And that's nowhere in the literature, any literature at all, and yet he does it. And there's just this incredible tendency to exaggerate. So what's fascinating about this to me is the reason I spend so much time on these principles is the framing matters. Because if you can frame the discussion around, hey, I believe in carefully weighing the benefits and the side effects, and you know that includes fossil fuels benefits, their climate mastery benefits, and looking at the side effects but being even-handed, so negative and positive and precise, Nobody can disagree with that, and it totally changes the way they think about it. They go from thinking about the issue in this sort of religious, dogmatic way, where it's just we're these evil sinners, and fossil fuels are this unlimited evil, and they're going to cause this unlimited destruction, to, no, no, let's just carefully think about this in a clinical way. And it's, it's made such a difference for me um, and for others. Now, there are two other issues of framing that I just want to talk about. I'm not going to focus on them today. They are important. They are important. I talk about them in Fossil Future, as well in some as well as in some of the resources I'll send out, but they are, one is, one of the key things that frames a conversation and frames thinking is what is your basic view of the relationship between Earth and human beings? And here there are two basic views. So one is what I call the delicate nurturer assumption, which is total pseudoscience but dominates, and this is the idea that nature exists in a delicate nurturing balance that is stable, sufficient, and safe. So it's stable, it doesn't change too much, it's sufficient, it gives us what we need as long as we're not too greedy, and it's safe, it won't harm us. And then the idea is that human impact is bad. Human beings are, are viewed as what I call parasite polluters. So we just take from the earth and we just ruin the earth. And the view is our impact is bad. And this, this view is why everyone always thinks that the catastrophe predictions are gonna come true, even though they never come true. Because this basic delicate nurture assumption, including this parasite polluter assumption, is so rampant. The great thing though is once you name it, it's really easy to refute, particularly if you have the true version. And the true assumption is what I call the wild potential assumption. So this is a view that nature has the potential to be amazing, but in its unimpacted state, it's wild, and it's actually dynamic, deficient, and dangerous. And so human beings, far from our impact being evil, it's actually uh, done intelligently an incredibly good thing because we're actually fundamentally producer improvers. So we add new value and we actually improve our environment, making it cleaner and safer, including things like taking naturally dirty and distant water and making it clean and close. So we are just, it's just another thing where if, if people have the right framing, it's pretty easy to convince them of the right thing, but if you, the earlier you can frame it, the better. And then the final thing, again, there's a lot more detail on this, but has to do with values, and I talked about this earlier today, but when you're thinking about, when we're thinking about our environment and the earth, what is the standard by which we're measuring good and bad? Which is another way of saying that is, what is our goal? And I think the dominant goal today is that's seen as good as eliminating our impact. So our impact is viewed as bad, we should eliminate it as much as possible, particular particularly our evil greenhouse gas emissions impact. And the, the good environment is one that's viewed as 
having as little human impact as possible. And you think about that, that is an anti-human idea because then the ideal earth is the earth that would exist had we never existed. That's the perfect earth according to this philosophy and yet everyone talks about it. Every hotel wants to be green, which just means minimize or eliminate impact. So what I propose is, no, no, when we're thinking about the world, our goal should be to advance human flourishing. We want the, the most human friendly planet possible, which means a beautiful place with as clean air and clean water as you can get, but in which we produce a lot of value. And so when, when you see these three issues of the thinking methods, the assumptions, the values, and you know what's going on be beneath the surface and you know how to frame them, it's incredibly, incredibly effective. So the reason why I focus so much on this is because I think this is the missing piece for everyone, for almost everyone, and in particular, this audience. I know you know a lot of facts, but I think the framing and its implication for communications is very powerful and you don't get exposed to as much. Now that said, it is really important to know facts. If you just have framing and you're ignorant, it doesn't help that much. So what I wanna share though is what I think are the 10 most essential facts to share with people. And my view is if you apply these, these principles to these really crucial facts, which I think are all essentially undeniable and they're all based on mainstream economics or primary sources in mainstream climate science, uh, it's obvious that we need more fossil fuels. So actually, the most controversial idea in the world is obvious if the issue is framed properly. So I'm just going to share. I'm going to do it pretty quickly with this audience, and I know I want to have some time for questions. Um, and you could get all of this stuff online. So I, 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 Jim sort of indicated I'm hard to get to get to speak and this kind of thing, but. Honestly, you don't really even need me speaking because everything I put for free online at energytalkingpoints.com. So I hope that I'm, I'm, I love speaking. I love doing it when I can. But if you just send an email to resources at alexepstein.com or you fill out your card, you'll get everything. And if you search Fossil Future, you'll get every single fact that I share today and dozens and dozens of more, dozens and dozens of more facts with references. I'm just going to overview them, but I think these are the 10 most essential facts for thinking about this issue and for communicating. And so fact one is cost-effective energy is essential to human flourishing. So let's break this down. Cost-effective energy has four elements. Affordability, reliability, uh, versatility. By the way, anyone, I, I'm very flattered by you taking pictures of the slides, and you're welcome to do it with all of them, but I will also send you the deck for free, so just keep that in mind if you just email that email. So there's versatility. This is really underrated. So this includes not just electricity, but the other four-fifths of energy uses in the world, including liquid fuel for heavy-duty transport. And then scalability. Can it provide energy to billions of people in thousands of places? And then my contention is the more cost-effective energy is, the more we have what I call human flourishing. And so human flourishing is people living to their highest potential, and in particular, long lives, healthy lives, fulfilling lives. And so my view is the more cost-effective energy is, the more people can live long, healthy, fulfilling lives. Now, why is this? Well, I have about 90 pages in Fossil Future really breaking this down, uh, but the basic idea is the more cost-effective energy is, the more we can use machines to produce value in the world. So um, human being, the planet is not a very hospitable place. As I mentioned, it's dynamic, deficient, and dangerous. In order to flourish, we need to be very productive. We need to produce a lot of new value, including we need to be able to neutralize all of nature's dangers, or as many as possible. The problem is we're physically weak. So the only way to get around that is we need to use machines to amplify and expand our productive ability. Amplify, I mentioned a harvester that can do a thousand times more work, that can allow one person to do a thousand times more work as he could without it and then also expand our abilities. Machines allow us to do things that no number of humans can do. So for example, I talk a lot about babies being saved by incubators. No number of us can get together and be an incubator. No number of us can get together and fly. And yet with machines, we can not only be a thousand times more powerful for certain things, we can have all new abilities. So the key to being productive and prosperous is machines, and the key to machines is having cost-effective energy. So you can power all the machines in the world, including all the machines that power all the machines that make the machines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, energy, the cost-effectiveness of energy is this underlies food, clothing, shelter, medical care, everything. And it also underlies innovation and progress. Sometimes people think, oh, well, Alex, you know, these, these increases in life expectancy. I, so I call these, these are the real hockey sticks, the hydrocarbons and human flourishing hockey sticks. So what you have is hydrocarbon use as measured by CO2 emissions, uh, you know, roughly speaking, and you have that goes up like a hockey stick at the same time as life expectancy, income, and the population. Now, is that just a random correlation? It could be, but I argue that it's causal for the reasons I gave. 
And sometimes people will, will come back and say, no, no, Alex, you're wrong. It's really sanitation that caused this. It's really science, technology, medical care. And my answer is, yeah, those are huge causal factors, but they all depend on energy. Because without energy, one is, the main thing is we don't have the time to do all of those other things. All those things, including innovation, depend on time. So energy frees up time, which allows us to specialize in those things and to have a lot of time to innovate in those areas. Uh, energy also powers all of those fields today. There's no modern medicine without all these amazing machines. And then, of course, there are the hydrocarbon-based products. And medical care in every other field totally depends on the amazing materials that only the hydrocarbon industry produces at at scale. So it's really cost-effective energy is essential to human flourishing and it is fundamental to human flourishing. So everything depends on it and I think even people who like energy don't appreciate energy enough. And once you get this thing, it, it's pretty quickly obvious that we need more fossil fuels because you get to, well, billions of people, this is number two, lack cost-effective energy. So we have, you see up here, a third of the world using wood and animal dung as their main fuel for heating and cooking. We have three billion people using less electricity than a typical American refrigerator. We have six billion people who use an amount of energy we would consider unacceptable. Uh, so the world just needs far more energy and yet nobody talks about it, but once you bring it up, it's obvious. It, so it, should be, it becomes very suspicious that we should use less fossil fuel. Then the third one is fossil fuels are a uniquely cost-effective source of energy. This is a little bit controversial, but it's really undeniable. So you look at the facts. Fossil fuels are the only source today that provide low cost, reliable, versatile, scalable energy for billions of people in thousands of places. No, nothing else even does it on a scale of one billion. Um, they provide 80% of the world's energy. They're still growing despite 100 plus years of aggressive competition and despite huge cultural hostility. Fossil fuel use is growing in particular in the places that care most about cost-effective energy, namely China, which has more coal under development than we have, period, at this point, just in development. And these are plants designed to last for 40 plus years. Um, and, you know, the argument you hear now is, oh, no, no, fossil fuels are no longer cost effective because, look, they've gotten more expensive recently. So I call this the Tanya Harding case against fossil fuels because <laughs> it's the people who opposed fossil fuels who crippled it, much like, you know, Tanya Harding's team and Nancy Kerrigan, and they say, oh, wait, now you can't, you can't skate, you can't produce fossil fuels. Like, well, there's no inability to produce it. It's just that in, that ability is restricted. Um, in terms of, it's important why fossil fuels are so crucial, and I think there are three, I talk about this a lot in chapter five of the book, but they have these three physical attributes that only nuclear has as well. So they're naturally stored, so it's like a natural battery, which is a really big advantage versus say solar and wind, which are natural intermittent flows of energy, which then you have to find some way to store, or you do what is done in practice and you just use fossil fuels as the battery, but then of course you're not replacing fossil fuels and you're adding a lot of duplication cost. Uh, they're naturally concentrated, particularly oil, storing a lot of energy in a small amount of space, or in the case of natural gas, a uh, low amount of mass. And then naturally abundant. There's just a huge amount of them. There's more than 10 times more hydrocarbon in the ground than what we've used in the hi entire history of civilization. So the, as we get better and better at harnessing it, we get to access more and more of that. And at the same time, the other thing is we've had an industry that has spent generations figuring out how to cost effectively harness uh, this material. Unfortunately, we don't have that for nuclear in large part because the green movement has criminalized nuclear to the point where we don't have a real nuclear industry. We're unfortunately many decades away from having one even under the best of circumstances. So fact four, which I think is important, is that unreliable solar and wind are failing to replace fossil fuels. Now, you can talk about they, they will fail indefinitely, but I think it's important to just have as a fact they are failing because it's usually presented as no, they're succeeding. And yet if you look at the facts, so they're providing less than 5% of the world's energy it's just electricity, which is one-fifth of the world's energy. It's used in significant quantities only when it has extreme government preferences, including subsidies, mandates, and all sorts of other preferences. Uh, it correlates strongly with higher prices. So this is not, an, uh, this is not rapidly replacing fossil fuels at all. And I think uh, the, the key to getting why is thinking of energy as a, as a process. People think, oh, solar and wind are gonna be free forever because they only think of, quote, the cost of the sun and the wind but the sun and the wind themselves don't give you energy. So the process gives you energy. And this is a really easy principle to get, but almost nobody is taught to think in terms of. So once you think of the full process, it's pretty obvious why it's really hard to do solar and wind cost effectively. And for those of you in Tex who are in Texas, this might be a traumatic triggering uh, event to see this, uh, but this is the Texas freeze from two years ago. 
And what you see is solar and wind before the freeze look great, right? So they're providing over half the electricity at times. You can have people bragging about it. But what happens when you have a big winter storm? Well, the sun largely disappears for obvious reasons, but so does the wind. And it's not that the wind turbines are frozen, which you could deal with, but it's just that the wind dies down often during these kinds of events. So at one point you get solar and wind at less than 1% of their so-called capacity, which is a ridiculous term to apply to something that you cannot control. It's not a capacity, it's just a fantasy. And so they were at 1% fantasy. And if something can go to near zero at any given time, what percentage of backup do you need? You need 100%, right? And what happens is Texas and California try to get around this because when, when you have 100% backup, which is basically what Germany has done, you have these huge costs of infrastructure duplication. So you try to get away with what I call reliability chicken, right? Which is you shut down as many reliable power plants as possible, you invest as little as possible in things like weatherization, and then you hope that the sun shines enough, the wind blows enough, it doesn't get too hot, and it doesn't get too cold. So this is like the energy policy maybe for 4,000 years ago. This is not an energy when you're praying to weather gods. This is not an appropriate energy policy uh, for the 21st century. And this is why you have these, these disasters if you have more costs and you have reliability problems. So the fifth one, um, in terms of the benefits of fossil fuels, is that fossil fuels give us this incredible ability to master climate danger. I mentioned this earlier, but it's really, really important to know this one fact, that climate-related disaster deaths, so storms and floods and extreme heat and extreme cold, all these things that are supposedly getting worse, have gotten incredibly better. They're down 98% over the last century. So as I like to say, and I know Mark Morano likes this expression, uh, fossil fuels haven't taken a safe climate and made it dangerous, they've taken a dangerous climate and made it safe. So it's really, really important to think of these climate mastery benefits and to be aware of how significant they are. I mean, one example is we have a million, 100 million people living below high tide sea level. So if we're worried about sea level rises, we really need to factor this in. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the side effects. Um, and this will be quicker because you already get a lot of this material and are more familiar. But this is all just mainstream stuff, but you don't get it or you get it in a distorted form. So one is that our CO2 emissions in the last 170 years have correlated with one degree Celsius warming and significant greening. And to put that in perspective, like this is what the, when you, you know, they like to put, make the warming look like this by compressing the y-axis to one degree or half a degree. But if you just put it on a normal human temperature scale, it doesn't look that significant. And, and on its own, it's not that significant. Now people think, oh, well, we're, we're on the verge of everyone dying of heat. But no, no, the world has far more cold-related deaths than heat-related deaths. And so we can expect, going forward, warming for the foreseeable future will lead to more lives saved from cold than it will be uh, taken due to heat. Now then people think, oh, well, it's gonna, the equator is going to get so hot and it's going to ruin everyone's life there. But then you look at, well, this is from climate.gov and NOAA, and the Biden administration. This is not some right-wing source. This is warming occurring more in colder places during colder seasons at colder times, particularly at northern latitudes. And so what this means is that it's going to save even more lives due to warmth because the, the coldest places are going to get less cold versus the hottest places getting that much hotter. And so then people think, oh, well, what's going to happen is it's, we're going to hit a tipping point. And, you know, the greenhouse effect is it's going to be like this and then it's going to be like this. But every single model, every single climate model involves a diminishing greenhouse effect. So the reason why they talk about climate sensitivity in terms of you have to double it is because it's a logarithmic or diminishing function. And so even when it's an extreme model, they're still saying the warming over time tapers off. So it's not at all oh, this out of control thing. And this is why we could have a planet that used to have estimated 10 times more CO2 or more, and yet the planet did not, quote, burn up. So it's just when you look at these facts, you, it's not that you don't believe that we impact climate. I definitely believe that we do, but you don't view it at all as a catastrophe and certainly not one that justifies the apocalypse of getting rid of fossil fuels in 27 years. And then the fifth one, and this relates to all the other supposed consequences of warming, is that even if you look at the IPCC, which is very, very biased in many ways, if you look at what they project in terms of changes in weather and sea level due to warming, they're all masterable by an empowered world. So you take something like sea level rise, which is a lot slower now than it was for our ancestors. We already have 100 plus million people living below high tide sea level. We have people thriving in the Netherlands far, far below sea level. As long as we're free, as long as we have energy, there's nothing coming that we can't deal with. Um, so to wrap it up, basically if we're free to use fossil fuels, we're going to have some more warming and greening. 
and the world is just going to be a lot better and a lot more livable. Uh, versus if we don't, in the near term, it'll be, I guess, a little bit less warm and a little bit less green. Although in the long term, what will happen is you will, you'll be much slower to develop alternatives because the key to developing alternatives is freedom and innovation. And the only way alternatives will ever really proliferate is if they're so cheap that China and India will voluntarily use them because they're obviously not going to actually agree to some commitment to impoverish themselves, nor, uh, nor should they. So if you just look at the, this basic calculation of carefully weigh the benefits and the side effects, it's just obvious that we need more fossil fuels. The benefits of continuing and expanding, at least for the next few decades, are just so, so overwhelming, and it is absolutely the apocalypse to reduce, to try to rapidly reduce them. So I think the proper policy is what I call energy freedom, and I work a lot with elected officials now on making this a reality, is freedom for all forms of energy, including fossil fuels. And if we do that, we can have an abundant and safe world, and it'll eventually be one uh, where we lower our emissions just because there will be superior technologies. But the main focus should be empowering 8 billion people as quickly as possible to promote human flourishing. So, so the thing I wanted to stress tonight is just all of this is so simple once you frame it the right way. That's why I wanted to stress the framing and encourage you to take advantage of all the free resources and in particular sh share them with other people. So I just want to make one final point about the, uh, today's energy education opportunity, uh, which is that we have a situation right now where we have a crisis. And the one good thing about the crisis, a crisis, is that it calls the establishment into question. So people are more open than ever. Than, I can't imagine they've been this open for 40 plus years to new ideas about energy because the establishment is clearly responsible for the energy crisis. Now they're trying to deny it, but it's pretty obvious we don't have enough fossil fuels and that's probably related to all the people who said we shouldn't have fossil fuels. Like, it's just pretty straightforward. People are open to that. They're more interested than ever. Even when I was writing this book, Fossil Future, a few years ago, people said, why would anyone read a book called Fossil Future? Fossil fuels are obviously the past, and now we have President Biden who ran on, I guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel. Now he's begging Venezuela and Saudi Arabia for more fossil fuels. So there's really a shift. And the other thing, I think, and this is something I'm proud to have contributed to, is we have much better arguments now. Particularly, I mentioned, you know, the two things I've created are Fossil Future, uh, the book, which I think is, uh, if I can move this slide, uh, I think is, like, I wrote it, I spent a lot of time rewriting and just totally redoing my initial book because I thought it needed to be replaced with something better, and I think it's just been way, way better, way more effective than the first book I did. And then the other resource I really want to highlight because it's free is energytalkingpoints.com. And again, if you fill out the card or you send an email to resources at alexepstein.com, you will get it. But it is, uh, you know, this is kind of my life's work, but just every single thing is the length of a tweet. So it's just super, super easy to share. This is what I create for politicians. This is what I create for other activists. And I think it's super, super helpful. So I hope that you use it and take advantage of this opportunity. Share it with as many people um, as you can. So if you want to uh, get in touch, again, resources at alexepstein.com for the resources. If you have any interest in, in speaking, uh, speaking at alexepstein.com, you can always try it out. And then you can reach me directly at alex at alexepstein.com. So the sort of the final wrap up of my talk is the key is the framing of it, particularly this idea of carefully weighing benefits and side effects. And if you do that, and if you're aware of these 10 undeniable facts, and you either share them yourself or you just share all these free resources with them, you can be incredibly effective. Now, I know I uh, want to take questions. Well, let me just say a couple words. Uh, people can start raising their hands, but I want to say about two or three minutes about uh, two people who unfortunately died in the last year, which are Pat Michaels and, and Jay Lair. So uh, both of these guys, the thing I want to emphasize, and I think this will be hopefully useful as well as just paying tribute to them, is that both of them did something for me that, is, that was pretty rare and made a really, really big difference at the right time. Now, Pat Michaels I first met in 2011, and I was a big fan of his. I'd kind of read him for a while, and he, he was giving a talk. And in his talk, he, had a con he said, I have a contest. And, it was, uh, and he said, the winner, whoever guesses what this is first wins a beer with me. And I was so excited. I was like, I got to win this contest. But I thought, I have no chance at winning this contest. I mean, there are 150 people in this room. How am I? And it's probably going to be some scientific thing. But then he flashed a picture on the screen, and it was of a building that said State Science Institute. So I don't know about everything, but I know a lot about Ayn Rand. And so it was, it was from, he said, where is this from? And I just said, Atlas Shrugged immediately, and nobody even started talking. And then I won that, that beer, and it was amazing. And he really, really like, talked to me, and he gave me tips on, uh, 
on women, and you know that ended up working really well because <laughs> now it engaged, um, and it was just uh, it was amazing. But then a couple years later, I was sending out my book, the moral case, uh, the moral case for fossil fuels, around, and. Uh, the first person who shall, remain, who shall remain nameless who read it was someone I thought might be sympathetic but might not. He's a very well-known name. And he just trashed the thing. He's like, this is the worst thing. He basically hated me. And I wasn't, I'm not that easily cowed by things, but I was still not super happy that was the first thing that I got. But then very soon I heard Pat Michaels had something and I'm kind of worried, oh, what's he going to say? And he was just so effusive and he just said, like, this is really the best book I've read of this kind. And the thing that I really appreciated is he was really focused on the positive. And that's really, that can be unusual with those of us who are intellectuals in this realm because it's very easy to focus with other people on, hey, how can you correct them? And that's, that's an admirable motive in many ways because you want to help people. But it can also be really helpful to people who are young and getting started, if they're doing something well, to actually encourage that, particularly if you're in a position of authority where they respect you. It just meant so much to me that he gave me that encouragement at that time. He also helped me a lot with Fossil Future and was very encouraging about that. And that was just the constant thing I got from him. He'd help me with things, but he'd always be dominantly encouraging. And when he disagreed, it would just always be in that context. And you know, Jay Lair was, was this as much as anyone I, I could imagine. I had interviewed him on my show Power Hour, but I never met him. And then in 2014, I believe I was speaking at the Heritage Institute, and Jay came up after it. And he's this kind of like Iron Man looking guy with a lot of energy. And after talks, I sometimes worry, don't let this influence you, but I sometimes, I, at the time I worried about like, it was new and it was one of my first presentations. I kind of worried about, okay, well, like, is this intellectual academic going to like come and just give me 10 criticisms that I don't feel like thinking about right now? And he just came and he was just like, Alex, this is amazing. I'm so happy. Like, I'm so encouraging. And it was just this, and he just radiated, I think those of you who know him, this is no surprise, but just radiated this positive energy. And I just found it so encouraging uh, at the time. And then uh, I just want to share with you some of the, just over the months, you know, in, you know, until right before he died, I mean, I think he emailed me a week before, he should be so encouraging. So just to give you a couple messages that just give you a sense of how encouraging he was, and just, just because I think he believed it and he knew that it was meaningful. I, I wrote a thing called My Energy Story, and he just wrote me, this is the last thing he wrote me. He said, Alex, this is amazing and so great you took the time to tell your real story. I am confident 2023 will be the beginning of turning the corner and overturning the folks desiring to enslave us all. So he's you know, very timid in his language, like, like me. And then he said, I mean, this is really sad to think about, but he said, at a later date, I would like to retell your story in third person titled One Man's Path to the Truth About Energy. So he's just constantly full of, of ideas. Uh, you know, he, when I wrote Fossil Future, he was one of the first people to send something to me. He said, you know, your book arrived and it's so very impressive. I cannot imagine the hours you've put in writing it. And he talked about he wanted to write articles based on it, which he did. But then the thing that meant the most to me uh, was he was actually just interested in me personally, even though we had no real personal relationship. He said, hope you had a great vacation with your fiance. I am guessing that you work a bit too hard. At 85, still working full time because I figured out the balance thing when I was 20. While I work some every day, there is never a day I go to bed thinking I was a drudge all day. By my own personal definition, I have some fun every day. Also, I only breathe through my nose and only six times a minute. And then, and little did he know, I'm a, like a total junkie for this stuff. So I loved it. So I asked him for more. And, I, and he said, I can, I can still work full time at 85 and now I'll only work a 35 hour week, which is actually five hours all seven days. And uh, then he sent me, and if anyone wants to see this, uh, maybe he published it online, I don't know. But then he sent me, he has a daily philosophy to maximize happiness. And I'll just read two of them. Uh, he has 10 points. So if you want to just email me, Alex at alexepstein.com, I think he'd be very happy for everyone to have it. Uh, he said, reward, number seven. You may, you may have heard that the best reward for a job well done is in fact the job well done. Do not live for recognition for what you accomplish. It is certainly nice when you get it, but when your own satisfaction is the, or your own satisfaction is the reward you cannot lose. I love that idea. And then he said, number nine, wonder. Do your best to recapture your childhood sense of wonder every day so that the beauty of nature and technology do not escape your notice and your ability to just say, wow. And I love that he has both nature and technology. I think it really captures why, he, why the concept of human flourishing resonated so much with him. So I, I hope that everyone takes a lot from what I gave today. And I just want to thank you and Heartland for giving me so much and including exposing me to uh, Pat Michaels and Jay Lair, whom I, I will never forget. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I don't know if we have, do we have any time for questions? Okay. Questions? questions? Nate. Nate. Oh, can, I, can I get some water? Hey, Alex. Um, I, great presentation. I fully agree with you on the decriminalization of nuclear. And I was just wondering if you could comment on what I think is one of the problems, which is the linear no threshold um, theory. <laughs> sure. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, so he's asking, he said he was enthusiastic about the presentation. He particularly liked the idea of decriminalizing nuclear, which is a big focus of mine in my work with elected officials. And if I could just elaborate, and then he particularly mentioned the linear no threshold uh, model uh, in terms of you know, how, you think of the, how you think of different kinds of damages of substances in various quantities. And yeah, the basic, uh, I mean, I have nothing original to say about this, but I agree with uh, the good work that's done, including by, I think, some people associated with these Heartland conferences, which is just linear no threshold makes no sense, and it's bizarre that it's, and it's bizarre and it's destructive. So, you know, the example is sunlight, where you think linear no threshold would say that if being out 12 hours in the sun naked with no sunscreen is harmful, then being out 20 minutes must be some fraction of that harmful. Versus the way damage works is not like that. It's not linear with no threshold. There's often a threshold at which it's benign, or even a threshold at which it becomes beneficial. It's what's called a hormetic uh, model. So you have something like sunlight, which clearly is that. Some amount of exposure is good. You know, some is probably benign, and some is clearly bad. And the fact that our government functions on LNT is just incredibly destructive. I think it's one of the root causes, but there are many, many other tentacles of it that need to be changed in terms of like approval process. And I think ultimately one thing that needs to happen is nuclear just needs to become a state issue. I don't think there's a reason why it's a national issue. And then at least you can have one of these kinds of laboratories, sets of laboratories the founders envisioned where different states can have different nuclear policies instead of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, doing it, which it's, it's just basically like nuclear, it's really NRC is nuclear reactor criminalization because they haven't approved a plant from beginning to end since their inception in 1975. So when I was negative five years old. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for tonight's presentation. Appreciate it, loved your book. Thank you. If you are correct, which I think you are, that human flourishing meets uh, people and gets a, a great deal of positive feeling back, and yet the dominant uh, cultural meme is something other than that. Does that what does that suggest to you about those who are pushing the dominant meme? Well. There are two elements, and this I, I cover this a lot in particularly chapter three of Fossil Future. So, I mean, one thing is, I think a lot of the leadership is not pro-human, but I do I do think a lot of what happens is that the way anti-human ideas get put over is they become is they package themselves with pro-human ideas, and they want you to look at the pro-human part of the package and then they want you to ignore the anti-human substance of the package. So an example is just the idea of being green or, quote, minimizing environmental impact. The pro-human part of that is, yeah, we want to minimize negative human harming impacts, right? Negative comma human harming impacts. So we want to minimize pollution. We want to minimize the destruction of natural beauty. But it gets green means minimize all human impact, including farms and factories and roads and all these things we need to live. So they want you to think about clean air and clean water. But the substance of it is just to be anti-development, anti-industry, period. I think one of the keys to winning on this is for every important issue to have a clear, positive concept on it. So I think one reason the environmental movement, the anti-human environmental movement took over is there wasn't a pro-human environmental movement, even though the capitalists should have had it because they lead to much better environments, mainly through property rights. But so what happened is the anti-freedom movement owned the issue of environment in this anti-human way, and then the other side kind of just reacted to their claims and tried to debunk their claims, but they never owned the issue of, no, 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 we are for an amazing, beautiful, safe, clean world. And I think when somebody's packaging together bad and good, if you consistently embrace the good, 
uh, you own the value issue, and then it becomes clear, no, these people really aren't about that. They just hate human impact. And there, there's examples with this for everything. If you want to see another one, I have a way of handling ESG this way. If you go to energytalkingpoints.com, just search ESG, and you'll see. Um, um, I blame a lot of this on Rachel Carson and her precautionary principle in Silent Spring. What do you think? Well, she, I mean, she's clearly, with these cultural moments, it's hard to know, it's hard to know how, you, like, how unique they are. Like, would there have been another person a year later? Because there were a lot of trends that were happening. I mean, there's a, I'm a big Ayn Rand fan, and she had a book called The New Left, which was really documenting this as it was happening, which I highly recommend reading uh, The Left, Old and New, that essay, and then a, an essay called The Anti-Industrial Revolution, because you get a sense of the political left, which really is anti-capitalism is the essence, I think, at least back then, you know, they were really at a crisis point because they, because socialism had failed to be industrially productive. And they had claimed that socialism was gonna be so productive and it clearly failed. And there was this choice, okay, which do you want? Do you want production or do you want socialism? Because you have to choose. And they could have just said, well, we choose capitalism because we really cared about production. But it turned out at least a lot of them really cared about lack of freedom. That was more important to them than production. And so what happened is they, they needed a new cause and they had the Vietnam War for a while, but then they, they decided to take on this issue of environment and it was really capitalism is bad because it impacts our environment too much. And again, there's that issue of they packaged good, bad environmental impacts with good and, and the other side didn't react properly. But sort of once you have that whole strategy in place, it's, it's hard to know how much race, Rachel Carson matters, but she was certainly a huge figurehead. I mean, almost like an Al Gore. And she was very effective. I mean, I don't know her exact responsibility for precautionary principle, but one way to think of precautionary principle is it is the least cautious principle imaginable because it says basically don't do anything until you can prove there's no risk, which is an, a complete recipe for death and a complete recipe for stagnation. So the precautionary principle is actually the world's most reckless principle. Last question over here. I hope that's here. <laughs> yes, that's you. Uh, uh, Alex, I am, after studying this, I am very stunned at the degree that the oil majors are running away from this issue. For instance, the API has come out and supported the climate change thing. Exxon, you know Exxon, you know Shell, you know, all these people are running away from it. And you mentioned that you went in, uh, and talked to them. It seems like they're uh, treating this as a more of a, a, a publicity PR issue than an existential threat on their industry, which they really should. And what's really stunning about this, in, in my view, is the science does not support the catastrophic global warming to any degree whatsoever. What progress have you made? Uh, what, what do you view their, uh, their opinion is on this? I mean, how are they going to keep running away from this issue? Let me give the most benevolent interpretation of it. I think it's important because, and this is a similar thing with elected officials, because I'd often get the question like, hey, why don't our elected officials say much rational about this issue? And one thing that's kind of easy to do is just say, well, they're being jerks and stuff, and like they're not courageous enough. Uh, but another perspective is they're in a difficult position because their expertise is not persuasion. And many of the people they hire to do persuasion are going to be people who believe the mainstream thing, right? So, this, and I often tell them, this is a mistake. Like, they'll say, oh, we hired the best PR people. And I'll ask the PR people, hey, what do you think about this? It's like, oh, well, we're, we're, we're climate catastrophes. Wait a second. You're hiring someone to persuade the public who hasn't even persuaded themselves. So how are they going to teach you how to persuade the public? So one thing I've, I, I tried to think about is, how do I make their jobs, as, their difficult job as easy as possible? I think where I really started cracking it was energytalkingpoints.com because that was putting every single issue in a very distilled, concise form where they could just look it up. And just to give you some examples, um, you know, I was, and I'm not taking credit for any of these, but you just see like things like Senator Mike Lee the other day was tweeting about like fossil fuels and human flourishing. And like, you know, you, that's really a, you know, I, I'm, that's just one of many examples where I saw there was a congressman the other day who was talking to AOC, I think it was Tom Tiffany, and he said, uh, and I, I don't know if he got this from me, but I think at least indirectly he did, because he was asking AOC, hey, I know you're looking at the negative impacts of fossil fuels, are you also looking at the benefits? And it really stunned her for a second, 
but it's notable, like, oh my gosh, these guys are actually using the framing. It's, it's really, really cool. But what was necessary for that to happen was not just me giving them a long argument and then saying, hey, you have the courage to do this. It was, it was, um, it was creating it in a, in a form that was very, very user-friendly for them. So what I've tried to do with industry is give them the words they need in the form that they need them. Now, uh, I mean, certainly ExxonMobil is a big disappointment. I think all these super majors are, but what you're seeing is you're seeing some smaller companies stand up. And you might have seen a couple years ago, did anyone see this North Face campaign? This anti-North Face campaign? So a guy named Adam Anderson, who explicitly credited Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, CEO of Innovex Downhole Solutions, he wrote to the North Face after they refused to sell him jackets with his logo on them, even though, of course, the jackets are made of oil and natural gas, but they, they didn't want to do it. But he wrote this open letter and went viral and it got covered everywhere. And then another CEO who's courageous, Chris Wright of Liberty, Ener now Liberty Energy, he did a whole campaign as like, thank you, North Face, being facetious, but bringing this up. And both of them have been very outspoken. Chris runs a public company. There are others who do this. And what's so gratifying to me is not just that they're doing it, and that I had some influence, at least in Adam's case, Chris is kind of his own self-made man on, on this, and I'm a big fan of his, but it's working. The other side has no answer, and so if you get people doing it and it's working, that's what's really effective, and I'm really excited to say, I was talking to Adam today, and we, we just made a deal, and I'm gonna go to an event of his on April, I believe it's April 18th, but you have to look it up. So if you just look up Innovex Downhole Solutions on Google, maybe I'll, I'll try to remember to send this out with my resources, but check this out. So this is a you know, significant oil company and they have an event and it's a huge event in Midland, Texas and the event is titled Fossil Fueled. So I think that is awesome that the industry is being proud of producing fossil fuels. Now, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish it was happening all the time, but it's not. But I think by giving people the right words in the most effective form and then proving that it works, you can bring the best out of them versus just criticizing them for being weak at their difficult job, which they do deserve some criticism. But my view is let's empower them by giving them the best, easiest to use uh, materials. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll be around for a while. So if anyone wants to chat or take a picture or get a book signed, uh, let me know. But thanks so much for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, to close out the evening, please welcome to the stage the chairman of the board of the Heartland Institute, Joe Morris. Well, ladies and gentlemen, at last night's opening dinner, I closed by saying, let the revels begin. I hope during the course of today's proceedings, you have seen these as revels. You have seen a reason for joy, a reason for happiness, even in the celebration of lives we've lost. There is reason for joy and reason for optimism. As someone who has entered into his eighth decade, I feel empowered tonight to say thank you to Alex Epstein, speaking as a fossil. Uh, <laughs> I'm very grateful to Joe Nova, who's not in the room, but was virtually in the room earlier this evening, for speaking to us from the future. So I hope you realize that it was tomorrow already in Australia when she was speaking to us. I am supremely grateful to Brother Essex, the Canadian, for putting a label on us that I shall proudly wear home and tell my granddaughter about. My granddaughter is, is lately learning lessons about gender and the multiplicity of them. And it, it's occurred to me in the course of these proceedings that the anti-human bias may also explain why binary sexuality is called into question in our time, because of course, what does binary sexuality, the male-female thing, lead to? It, it leads to more humans. And of course, if humanity is the problem, if human impact in every measurable way uh, is, is the problem, then the creation of more humans, as Paul Ehrlich insisted to Julian Simon a generation ago, is the truth. As Malthus said a couple of centuries ago, is, is the truth that fewer humans are the answer to all problems. But of course, as Julian Simon pointed out, uh, the, 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 the flaw in this Malthusian economic view of the world is 
that humans don't just come with downsides and side effects. Humans also come with tremendous benefits. And part of the benefit of humans, at least free humans, is that free humans dream up solutions to problems that a dangerous, dynamic, and deficient nature imposes upon us. So in, in this uh, peculiarly gendered time, I'm thrilled to have a new label. I proudly call myself an Essexian. <laughs> and I will, re I will return home telling people that I spent my weekend in Florida at an Essexian conference. <laughs> That will, that will raise eyebrows in some quarters and improve my street credibility in others. <laughs> now, uh, it falls to me to point out the flaw in Brother Epstein's argument tonight. And there was a flaw, because he said that the nobody, I think yeah, he, he used that noun, nobody is making the, the, the other side of the case, not the capitalists and the economists. That, of course, is the point of, point of reason for existence of the Heartland Institute. The point of existence of the Heartland Institute is to offer free enterprise solutions to human, economic, and social problems. Um, those problems include problems of adapting to a nature, an earth, a planet that is deficient, dynamic, and dangerous. And I think, looked at properly, the course of human history shows that there is a correlation between freedom on the one hand and safety, wealth, and human flourishing on the other. As a matter of fact, perhaps the most interesting hockey stick graph one might imagine is a hockey stick graph that shows the correlation between freedom uh, as, as on the, the x-axis, I guess that's the horizontal one, isn't it? And human well-being, measured by wealth or any of a number of objective standards, is the y-axis, the vertical axis. Something amazing happened around 1776. There's a kind of a flat line going along, and you get to 1776. And then in around 1776, a couple of very interesting ideas came on the global scene at about the same time. One is the notion of the rule of law that... <clears throat> ought to apply to governments as well as everybody else. And that there's something to be said for individual liberty and constraints upon governments by the rule of law through constitutional systems and the like. Uh, that was kind of an American message. And on the other side of the pond in Britain that same year, Adam Smith was publishing The Wealth of Nations, which was opening eyes to the realities of economics, this notion that the invisible hand can know more than a whole room full of experts about how to achieve human flourishing and human welfare. I love the Essexian observation, the quotation of Richard Feynman that uh, science is, uh, is belief in the ignorance of experts. Is that not what F.A. Hayek tells us is, is the road to serfdom? It's the failure to hold that belief. If you believe in the wisdom of experts, you're on the road to serfdom. Wisdom lies in believing in the expert, the ignorance of experts of all kinds. That's what human freedom is about. That's what human debate is about. That's what the integrity of the scientific method is about. That hockey stick that begins in 1776, of course, shows, uh, as Milton Friedman said, he was quoted by Mark Morano at lunch today, Milton Friedman once observed that most of human history in most places, at most times, people have lived under tyranny and in poverty. And you come along in this flatline hockey stick of people in poverty, and then suddenly around 1776 or thereabouts, something happens and human flourishing and human wealth shoots up. And that is a powerful correlation between freedom, the rule of law, free market economics, private property, property rights on the one hand and human flourishing on the other. I submit to you that the integrity of the Heartland Institute lies in the fact that we don't care what the truth is about climate science. We care that the truth be determined, that the truth be known, and that lies not be told. But it seems to us that if the truth is 
what the people in this room have taught us today and over many years that the truth is about climate science, then there is no reason to restrict the freedom of humans. Climate science does not justify the restriction of human freedom because it's not a valid case for it. But if the other side of the coin were true, if, if the, 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 the notions of the climate extremists were fair and truthful depictions of what science teaches, the integrity of the Heartland Institute lies in the fact that, that we would not be prejudiced against where the truth of science would take us because we would tell you that the solution then to those problems is freedom. It is unleashing human ingenuity to find, problem, find solutions to the problems that a dynamic, deficient, and dangerous Earth create. So, so our integrity lies in the fact that unlike leftist policymakers, we don't have to impose a scientific truth to make our case in the political sphere. Our contention is that the solution to these problems is human freedom that human, hum, the, the built into the human who is able to think and act freely are the opportunities to solve the problems of the planet. And that's why truth matters to us. Milton Friedman, my teacher at the University of Chicago, was fond of saying the problem with leftist intellectuals is they're always saying, well, I don't care if that works in practice. The question is, does it work in theory? I think that explains a lot about the problems of the way some scientists and lots of policymakers view modeling. They don't care what the truth is, they care what the theory is. Uh, as economists and as public policy practitioners, we try to be empiricists. And I think that the empirical fact is best shown in that 1776 hockey stick graph, where there is a measurable, arguable, defensible correlation between human freedom and human flourishing. In that spirit then, having seen what you have accomplished in the conversations today, I invite you to return for breakfast tomorrow morning. The doors will open at 7, the discussions will begin at 7.30, and let the revels continue. Good night. To date, more than one million Americans have died from COVID-19.